Welcome to Daily Devotion. I'm Pastor Krieger. We begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger. Keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all my doings in life may please you. Into your hands I commend my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the wicked foe may have no power over me. Amen. Uh, during Advent, uh, we are preparing for the coming of Christ. And it's in, in preparation for Christmas, of course. But we do it with, with an eye on his second coming, when he comes in judgment. Uh, and this is why Christmas is so important. Uh, it's because of Christmas. It's because Jesus came into the world to be righteousness for us, to bear sin for us. It's, it's because of that that his second coming isn't something for us to dread. Instead, it's something we look forward to. Uh, we don't anticipate his return with fear, but with hope. Now, when, you're, when you open the Bible, and if you want to see which portions of God's word he uses to build up that hope, would you first think to go to the Old Testament or the New Testament? First listen, before you answer that... <laughs> First, listen to what Paul says in Romans 15. Uh, this is verse 4. He says, For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us, so that through endurance and the encouragement of the Scriptures, we might have hope. So we've got this New Testament passage talking about the Old Testament, and it gives us a way to understand it. Um, we might sometimes, I, I think, emphasize the division between Old Testament and New Testament just a little bit too much. The fact is, it's the same story. It's God's story. And it's our story. We ought to claim the, these stories of the Old Testament. We ought to claim them as ours. We should see them as the story of our people, the story of us, the story of how God is, is uh, intervening in history to rescue us. Because we have the Old and the New Testament all telling us the same thing. We are people of God. And as you read on in Romans 15, there's another division here that, that if, we, if we misunderstand it, it's going to lead us to some false conclusions. Um, he's, Paul is talking a lot about Jews and Gentiles. And so for any of us that are not of Jewish descent, um, the, and the word, of course, for that is, is Gentiles. Sometimes the Bible uses the word nations to talk about everyone else, right? It feels like maybe we're excluded some, from some of these promises. How many times in the Old Testament does it talk about promise, promises made to Abraham and his descendants? And it continues on in the New Testament. Jesus came first for the people of Israel. John the baptizer preached to the people of Israel. When the apostles were sent out, they were specifically told, don't go to the Gentiles, go to the people of Israel. Well, what gives? And what about us? Well, here's what Paul's addressing in Romans 15. He's addressing it both for Jew and for Gentile. I'm going to read starting at verse 7. And I want, want you to see, uh, I'll pause and, and tell you where he's getting this stuff. I want you to see this beautiful progression of promises. How, how Paul uses the Old Testament to do exactly what he says that it will do. He uses it to teach, to encourage, and to give hope. So, uh, starting in verse 7, he says, Accept one another, then, just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. For I tell you that Christ has become a servant of the Jews on behalf of God's truth to confirm the promises made to the patriarchs so that the Gentiles may glorify God for his mercy. So these promises made to the patriarchs, to Abraham and his descendants, they were not just for their benefit, but also for us. And this is how he explains it. As it is written, Therefore I will praise you among the Gentiles. I will sing hymns to your name. That's from Psalm 18, 49. Praise you among the Gentiles. And then, and then he goes on. Again it says, Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. That's from Deuteronomy 32, 43. So the Gentiles rejoice with the Jews. Verse 11, And again, Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and sing praises to him, all you peoples. That's Psalm 117, verse 1. So all peoples, Gentiles and Jews, together praise God. And then, finally, uh, in verse 12, 
And again, Isaiah says, this is from Isaiah 11, this is what we had for our devotion yesterday. The root of Jesse will spring up, the one who will arise to rule over the nations. The Gentiles will hope in him. So Christ will reign over all regardless of nationality. And because of all this, Paul concludes this little section with a prayer in which he calls God the God of all hope. Uh, in this translation, it says the God of the God of hope, but He's the God of of all hope because God is both the source of our hope and He's the object of our hope. And Paul prays that God would fill His people with joy and with peace, fill not just to the point of being full, but fill filled to the point of overflowing, so that it spills out into the rest of our lives and into the lives of the people around us. And this is our prayer too, verse thirteen: May the God of all hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, I, th I think that maybe our first reaction to that is that this prayer seems kind of impossible or, or like that it's just not going to happen, right? And thinking about your own life, if there is such a struggle in your life, in your experience, and that, that you're enduring that you might think that your life could not be characterized by hope. It's characterized by pain and by, by struggle and, and maybe getting by. Um, let alone the idea that you could be overflowing with hope so much that it spills into all aspects of your life and into, into the lives of other people. If it feels that way, let's consider who it is that we're talking about here. The God who wants to do this, the God who can do this, this is the same God who brought his people, his chosen people, and that now includes us. He brought them out of Egypt after demonstrating his power in the ten plagues. He split the sea so his people could walk through it, and then he closed it up to destroy their enemies. And then he fed them for 40 years uh, with bread that fell like snow from the sky. And now uh, we could go on and list every single demonstration of his power, but I'm going to skip ahead to what might be the greatest and the most mysterious, that he took all of his divinity and power and somehow, in a way that we can't even understand, he became a human being for us. And so for a time, he set aside the full use of that power when he walked this earth, but he didn't lose any of it. He, he still had all of it, all the time. And the question for us is, how could the infinite be contained in a human form? And the answer is, I just don't know. But God says it, and so we believe it. And I know that what he has done and what he continues to do is more than enough reason to trust that he's going to do what he says he's going to do. That he can do what he says he can do. And he can fill you with his joy and his peace as you trust in him. And this is, this is the hope that we live in today and always. In the name of Jesus, amen. Let's join in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen.